And we pray. Amen. Yeah. We'll be in Acts uh, 28, uh, chapter 28, the first uh, 10 verses. For those who are into kind of geography and places in the first century, it has been conservatively estimated that <clears throat> we can account for 10,000 miles of travel uh, in the ministry of Paul. And the part that we're looking at today is 2,000 miles of that. And uh, eventually we'll have a little bit of a map that'll be smaller than the one that you had last week. But that's still just an amazing thing in that uh, a lot of it is over land, uh, a lot of it is, and you read these statements in danger of, and he'll talk about everything from bandits and rivers and everything else. And um, the other thing I just want to mention ahead of time is that when you read in 2 Corinthians 11, which is written previous to this, uh, he mentions that there have been three shipwrecks. And so when I read this one in Acts, then I feel like uh, this is the fourth shipwreck that Paul has uh, personally been involved with. And uh, that's just a scary thing to be uh, that helpless and um, an expression that uh, I use that you're kind of like a cork on top of the water waving back and forth. <clears throat> Coming back across the Pacific at one time, we were flying 39,000 feet. We were going 667 miles an hour, and we had 125 mile an hour tailwind. 45 minutes early, we get in, but just imagine, Charles, can you imagine making trips like that where you're flying 39,000 feet and you're going 667 miles an hour, and you have a 125, 29 mile an hour tailwind. And I look down at the ocean, and I think, just imagine what Paul would do with something like this in terms of his travels and getting out and seeing people and doing things. So what we want to look at today is that on the way to Rome, and he was told this both by vision earlier and Lord willing next week in the book of Romans, he has talked about uh, his desire to come to Rome. But on the way to Rome, um, he has a three-month visit on the little island of Malta uh, because of the shipwreck. And we're going to close with this today, but it's, I think it's a good place to start. When you look at all the things that he's been involved with up to this point, and the beatings and the stonings and everything else, and then uh, the stress of being uh, in the open sea for two weeks and they haven't hardly been able to eat and all this other stuff. Probably by the providence of God as I read this, uh, God's going to give him, and it's not necessarily a vacation, but it's a break. And so before he gets to the city of Rome, before he begins his defense, before all of these things take place, God is going to enable him to have some, can I use the term down time? Some time just to kind of catch his breath. And one of the things we want to notice is that very often God is working in our lives when we look back in hindsight uh, to accomplish things that we never could have planned or never could have done ourselves. And anticipate this next week, all of the major centers of culture and the cultures that are on the inscription over Jesus are described in the book of Acts. We're going to begin with Jerusalem, the center of Judaism. He will be in Athens in chapter 17, which will be the center of Greek thought and Hellenism and philosophy. And he's on his way to literally the center of the Roman Empire, the city of Rome. And then on the way, there's a stop off at this little island of Malta. And what's amazing to me is that no place is either too big or too small for Paul to be able to be involved in his work and his ministry and those types of things. <clears throat> and I was reminded of this while I was gone. Um, in 1997, 
in a little place called Terralgan in Victoria down by Melbourne. Um, I did a meeting for a church that had three people in it, a husband and a wife and a Filipino mail order bride. Ladies, how would you like to put your picture and some description in a thing and then some guy you've never known says, well, I'll help pay for her transport for her to come. And uh, she was a member of the church from the Philippines. Guess what you get to do every Sunday if you're in a church of three people? <laughs> Greg, you get to do the announcements. You get to lead the singing. <laughs> you get to do the Lord's Supper. You get to do the preaching. And there were nights we had eight to nine people come to this meeting that were people that they knew. And you couldn't wipe the smile off their face because this little group of three people, you know, the, the, the church had tripled uh, during this meeting and there were, you know, nine to ten people there. But that was the bride in that particular place. And I always remember Brother McCord would say, I asked him once, I said, how do you decide, decide where to go? And he said, well... I let God decide that and I just go to the next place that asks. And he came back one Monday and he had been in the, the far hills of Tennessee and he started talking. He says, I have, I have been with royalty this week. And he had been with a family in the upper hills of Tennessee that had literally uh, sawed off logs and sanded them and had stumps that they had sanded. And for their main meal, they had beanie weenies and crackers. And Brother McCord's version was, I have been with royalty this week. I've been with the people of God. And that's Paul. And so on the way to the larger and the bigger objective of the city of Rome, then we're going to have a three-month stop. And obviously because of the danger that they were in, uh, they were delighted, even though the ship was wrecked, to, to be safely there. So I want us just to stop and think today how sometimes the interruptions in our lives can be God-given within his providence. And just let that sink in. Sometimes the interruptions in our lives, we're going to do something and then God may have something totally different in mind and we want to be prayerful and have our eyes open because God may be using us and sending us to do something that uh, we had never thought about or planned. I wanted to repeat this short quotation because a part of what we're going to look at today is Paul's continued emphasis on God. <clears throat> and this to me is a very interesting description of Paul. Paul was a God intoxicated man. He spoke constantly about the one who was central to his thinking. Everything he dealt with, he related to God. His writings contained more than 40% of all the New Testament references to God that we have in the New Testament. And a part of what we're going to just notice and kind of pull some things together is that when Paul is speaking with Gentiles, obviously people who don't have the benefit of growing up in a synagogue and growing up having read the Old Testament scriptures, then his primary discussion and the things that he brings to mind are things about God. And so we'll touch just briefly a little bit on Lystra. We'll look at uh, Athens when he's there. And he will do the same thing in the synagogue, but when he's in the synagogue, it will always be here are the things that are the fulfillment of prophecy. And the prophets wrote this and God directed this, but he will primarily speak about the God of creation, the God of nature, uh, the God who's given us all these things around us that we can see. And so... <clears throat> On the island of Malta, he will be in that context again. And I just laugh a little bit. Uh, twice, uh, people wonder if he is a god or uh, blessed by gods. And again, these are Gentile pagan people. And little do they know that, no, he's not a little G-O-D, but the god of heaven is constantly on his thought and on his lips. <clears throat> um when you look down at number four, there may be detours on our way to seek and serve the purpose of God in our generation. And between our freshman and sophomore year, uh, Sheila and I went with, uh, it was probably 18 Oklahoma Christian students 
to a campaign to Belize, which at that time was called British Honduras. And during the World Mission Workshop, Ron Beaver found out that Belize, down on the edge of the Caribbean, was the only English-speaking country in the world where there wasn't an organized church that was worshiping. And so he just felt like, you know, that's within reach, that's something we can do, and let's get some students and try to visit. And then in the process, <clears throat> he met a church in Alabama that had done some work there, but they had offered Bible correspondence courses and had 21 people in the city of Belize who had finished a Bible correspondence course. So as we go to this city, then we have 21 people to track down and to try to contact. And uh, here's the Gulf of Mexico, and there's kind of like a triangle. And Belize is, was a city about 40,000 people uh, surrounded on sides by the jungle, literally, and then by the ocean on the other. <clears throat> so we were in this very concentrated area, but we had 21 contacts to start with and go to try to meet these people because they had finished the Bible correspondence course and uh, make contact with them. <clears throat> in our preparation to go, um, we knew her as Prissy Walk, who you will know as Prissy Sellers. Um, she made a comment one day in our meeting and she said, one of the things that I have learned is that sometimes when I'm on the way to do a Bible study with a person, God may have me meet someone that I didn't know and I hadn't had plans to meet. And if I keep my eyes and ears open, sometimes the person God really wants me to meet may not be the person I'm going to have the study with, but the people that I meet along the way. And very wise counsel. <clears throat> uh, Prissy had the top grades in both Hebrew and Greek. And I had told her a couple of times, Prissy, it'd be a whole lot easier to find a husband if you just didn't bruise the ego of every uh, preacher student in the Hebrew and Greek classes by just mopping the floor with them with, uh, with your grades. She was a very, very bright girl. But think about that observation. I'm going to do X, Y, and Z in my mind. And she said, if you keep your eyes and ears open, God may bring someone into your experience, into your knowledge that you weren't aware of before. And that's exactly what happened. I can't remember, maybe one or two of the 21 people who had finished the Bible course response courses were baptized, and I think we baptized 21, but those people knew someone who read their Bible, or they knew someone who went to a church, or, so we had referrals from these people, but the majority of the people that were eventually added to the church there were not the 21 who had finished the Bible course response course. And that's what I think of when I think of Paul, because in his mind, you know, he's off and he's going to Rome. But then look at all the things that happened to him that you read last week, and we're going to see today, that were a part of his experience in getting there, and then God is working uh, with him and through him in these different situations. <clears throat> this last weekend while I was in Melbourne, there was a couple, and they just said, we're from the mountain areas of the Philippines. And when they found out, you know, we were from Oklahoma City, they said, oh, do you know Prissy Sellers? says, yes, the congregation here supports her. And she said, well, uh, we benefit from two churches that Prissy and her family helped to establish in our area. Uh, oftentimes they go to an area, they work with some type of school, some type of education, and teach people. And uh, this couple said, uh, what a blessing that we have two different congregations in our area that we work with uh, directly because of the Sellers family, and you think, isn't that nice to kind of go full circle with people that we support and people that we know and the work that's going on? <clears throat> if you grew up in Sarah on the edge of the Dust Bowl, you never get tired of rain. Um, <laughs> I sometimes, we have a back porch, and I sometimes just go outside and just listen to the rain and think uh, through the dirty 30s and the Dust Bowl, how often my family would love to have set and listened to the sound of rain. What a, what a God sent. We're going to read the first part of Acts 28. <clears throat> After we were brought safely through, we then learned that the island was called Malta. The native people showed us unusual kindness, for they kindled a fire and welcomed us all because it had begun to rain and was cold. 
Well, first of all, they're drenched because they've come out of the ocean and they've survived getting on shore. <clears throat> David Roper mentioned this, and, and this is kind of gruesome. Uh, there were places, and I think he called them just landlocked pirates, where people took advantage of people who were shipwrecked and sometimes sold them into slavery and all kinds of things. So uh, you were virtually at the mercy of the inhabitants of wherever you were shipwrecked, and there are occasions where, where people were not showing them unusual kindness, and this is a part of uh, people reading this in the first century, but thought, oh, what a blessing. So instead of meeting some landlocked pirates who would take advantage of people, then here are people who showed them what Luke says was unusual kindness. Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and put them on a fire. A viper came out and because of the heat and fastened on his hand. When the native people saw the creature hanging from his hand, they said to one another, no doubt this man is a murderer. And though he was, or so he has, though he has escaped from the sea, justice has not allowed him to live. <clears throat> However, he shook off the creature into the fire and suffered no harm. Uh, they were waiting for him to swell up or suddenly fall down dead. But when they had waited a long time and saw no misfortune came to him, they changed their minds and said that he was a god. I, I don't mean this to be unusually, um, and I don't know what the word is, critical is not even the best word, um, I'm empathetic, but at the same time, it just kind of shake your heads. Uh, there are religious groups who are in the kind of the Pentecostal and these other things <clears throat> who are involved in handling deadly snakes as a part of their <clears throat> show of faith. And uh, <clears throat> I haven't looked for it, but for a number of years, I had a file on ex-snake handlers that while this was going on, got bit and died. So it's, it's kind of a cruel thing even to talk about, but they were doing this kind of as a religious movement because what is said toward the end of Mark? They will drink deadly poison, not die, they will handle this. And so seeing that part in Mark, then there are some religious groups that have actually handled deadly snakes, thinking that because of the spirit of whatever, then they won't die, and sadly that hasn't been the case. <clears throat> but I read of a man who was doing a debate with people in this group, and for the closing of his part of the debate, and I don't know what it was, but he had a bottle of cyanide or something like this, and he told the guy, he said, you can win the debate if you'll just drink this. <laughs> and of course, you know, the guy's not going to. And we don't want to make light of people who sincerely believe something, but it's it's not the focus of what the New Testament is about. And what's interesting is that <clears throat> the miracle that Paul is gonna perform and the people that he are gonna heal, uh, we're gonna see very similar things in the ministry of Jesus, uh, the ministry of Peter, and the ministry of Paul, uh, but this will be the last time that we will have a record of, of Paul being involved in healing in his ministry. So they go from thinking that he's been cursed by the gods to thinking, oh, he was a god. Now in the neighborhood of that place where the lands belonged to the chief man of the island named Publius, who had received us and entertained us as, hosp I can't say hospitably, for three days. And it happened that the father of Publius lay sick with fever and dysentery. And Paul visited him and prayed put his hands on him and healed him. And when this had taken place, the rest of the people on the island who had diseases also came and were cured. They also honored us greatly. And when we were about to sail, they put on board whatever we needed. <clears throat> so what I'd like for us just to notice and this is a, a little comment from the, the Tyndall Handbook of Bible Charts. Um, Paul is going to begin the 2,000 mile trip to Rome, first of all at Caesarea, and then to avoid the open sea, the ship follows the coastline of Asia Minor, and then you'll see 
at Myra, Paul was put on a vessel bound for Italy, and it went to Crete, <clears throat> the place of Fair Havens, and then you'll see the stretch all across the Mediterranean where they were for the two weeks um, before the shipwreck. So here's where I want us to come back to the thing about Paul's emphasis on God. And in the synagogues, as we mentioned, we will find a very clear message about the fulfillment of prophecy. But here's Acts 17, and I misplaced this. This is actually to um, the Gentiles. But notice this comment in Athens. Paul went, as was his custom, and, well, this is in Thessalonica, and on three Sabbaths, and again, here we are in the, in the synagogue. Three things happened. He reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that it was necessary for Christ to suffer from the dead. This Jesus who I proclaim to you is the Christ, and some were persuaded, many of the devout Greeks, not a few of the leading women. But here we are on the Sabbath day, and the approach that Paul uses in teaching people is especially this reasoning from the scriptures. And then when we're in a Gentile situation, remember in Acts 13 at Lystra, uh, they declared uh, Paul and Barnabas to be gods. But then as one writer said, and then before they left, uh, they stoned Paul within an inch of his life. And so we're gonna have two contrasting places where people thought initially Paul was a god. And in the first case, he was nearly killed. And then the one where we are today, then the people blessed him and helped take care of them. <clears throat> Paul, in a loud voice, said to this man, stand up on your feet. And he sprang up and began walking. <clears throat> the crowd saw what Paul has done. They lifted up their voices, saying in Laconian, the gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. Barnabas they called Zeus. And Paul Hermes, because he was the chief spokesman. But when the apostles heard this, they tore their garments, they rushed, and they said, men, why are you doing this? Because we are men of like nature with you. And we bring you good news that you should turn from these things to a living God. And this is what I want you to notice. Every time Paul is with the Gentiles, there's something about God, but in contrast to um, a dead statue that can't uh, breathe, that can't talk or anything else. He oftentimes will refer to God as the living God. And notice the five things that he mentions. He made heaven and earth and the sea. He allowed all nations to walk in their own ways. Verse 17, he did not leave himself without witness. He did good by giving you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. And with these words, they scarcely restrained the people from offering sacrifice to them. And again, remember the statement, Paul is a God-intoxicated man. And when he's speaking to a Gentile audience, then God is the focus of his teaching. We come to Acts 17 when Paul is in the city of Athens. I found this inscription to the unknown God. What you worship as unknown, I proclaim to you, and see, here it comes, the God who made the world and everything in it, the Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, for he himself gives to all men life and breath and everything, and he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on the earth, determine the allocated periods and boundaries of their dwelling, that they should seek God, feel their way toward him and find him, and yet he is actually not far from us, for in him we live and move and have our being, even as some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. If then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and the imagination of man. The times of this ignorance, God once overlooked, but now he commands all men everywhere to repent. He has fixed a day in which he will judge the world by a man whom he has appointed, and of this he has given assurance to all men by raising him from the dead. And I think part of what Luke is doing, because 
When you read the, when you read the book of, of Acts, especially, it's kind of like a collage. It's like this, uh, these things are kind of woven together. And at different times, we see examples of Paul uh, teaching and preaching to those who don't have a, an Old Testament background. And then we also see him teaching and preaching both in synagogues and to people of the Jewish mind. But God is always a part of it. And whether he starts with the God of creation or the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecies, he always ends up at some point or another talking about God raised him from the dead. And whether he comes to it from this point of view or from this point of view, he always has this middle ground that he will be speaking about the resurrection to both of these groups of audience. And I want just to kind of think about, and we'll do this a little bit, Lord willing, next week, uh, the opening of Luke and the end of Acts. Because <clears throat> when you look at the opening of Luke, uh, it, there's just these little examples, and it's like it's kind of a, a thread in these first three chapters that Luke just introduces uh, the work of John the Baptist and the ministry of Jesus uh, within the much wider Roman world. And n notice these references. In Luke 2, he will mention Augustus, the emperor, and Quinarius, who was the governor of Assyria. Of Syria. And then in chapter 3, here is the, the largest single historical section in the New Testament. And people who look at the dates of these people, you can kind of, you know, here's, here's all these guys who are listed, and you can draw a line and basically say, now Luke is saying, when all of these are serving at the same time, uh, this is when both the ministry of John begins and the teaching of Jesus. So in Luke 3 and verse 1, the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius. And see how clear it is? He starts with that. And then, oh, Pontius Pilate is governor of Judea. Herod is the tetrarch of Galilee. His brother Philip, tetrarch of the region of Iteria and Trachonitis. And Lysanias was the tetrarch of Abilene. And so when you look at the very opening, then there's just this saturation of Roman officials, emperors, Roman governors. And then how does the book of Acts close? This long, prolonged journey to the city of Rome. And again, there's kind of like this cultural parentheses, both with the beginning of volume one and the end of volume two, having to do with the wider Roman world. <clears throat> I think this other little bit is kind of helpful because this is an overlap with what uh, you looked at last week. But most sea travel was not done on passenger ships. Uh, most of the time, uh, cargo ships, people who were traveling in different places, and obviously places where you couldn't place cargo, then people would be allowed to travel. Uh, that would also help finance and benefit the trip as well. I won't remember their names right off, but um, I was given three biographies of our early missionaries in Africa. And the thing that was amazing was that the first family that I read, uh, there are no airplanes when they go, so the only way is, is ship. And they lived in Africa for 15 years before they came home. Uh, we were blessed to come back every three years but, you know, we lived in Australia for 12 years. How much does America change in 12 years? Um, Eastside had this banquet, and the punchline was apparently a Wendy's commercial of where's the beef? Well, we hadn't seen the Wendy's commercial, so we didn't get the punchline for a lot of what was going on because that didn't mean anything. You know, beef is either Angus or Hereford or, you know, but... Everyone got this joke of where's the beef and we didn't, we didn't get it. Can you imagine being gone for 15 years? So how did they get home? Well, you go to Johannesburg and then you go down to the dock and there's a place where you check and you find some type of ship that's going to England, but it's, it's not just a transport ship. It's carrying merchandise and other things. And so where they live, and you can't book the travel home. You go to Johannesburg, you get a trip to England, and then guess what you get to do? You go to another place in England and then find a ship that is passing across, 
uh, to come over, and um, one of the and and like I said, that was the first trip after 15 years. Um, after they got to Arkansas, um, they made visits and checked in with people. I'm assuming you would stay for a while if you've been gone for 15 years. Uh, the war was on and it wasn't safe to go back that way because of German U-boats, so they caught passage to South America and then came across the bottom. They didn't come home the next year, next time for nine years. So just stop and think of your family, your relatives, culture, and to have visited twice in 25 years is just an amazing thing. And, but when I read their travels and their journeys, I thought, oh, this sounds like Paul. We go to a certain place and we find a ship going to this area and a ship going to another. And so uh, these typically are not passenger ships, but they're commercial cargo ships. And you're able to, if I can use the term, hitch a ride, then you know what I'm trying to say. <laughs> What's also interesting is that Corinth had two ports on either side where people could land. And there, three months in the winter, most of the time people didn't travel. So Corinth was one of the favorite destinations for a lot of sailors. And I'll just say a lot of money changed hands through the winter time. But because of the conditions on the Mediterranean, there were three months where people most of the time didn't sail. However, Herod, and we're talking about Herod the Great, he was aligned with Antony and Cleopatra because if you don't support the Romans who are close to you, there's a huge cost. Uh, when they lost uh, in 31, the Battle of Actium, which is on the west side of Greece, then Herod got on a ship, chartered a ship in the middle of winter, and went straight to Augustus because he was the victor and he's got to change and get on the other side. And Herod's comment was, don't remember whose friend I was, but what manner of friend I am. Translated, I'll be as faithful to you as I was to the others, but these people in these provinces were always at the mercy of the, the Romans who were in their, their particular area. <clears throat> we're blessed, and I've been primarily with churches that don't have elders, uh, we're blessed to have elders which do so many things for us, ministry staff that does so many things. But there are a lot of churches that, hopefully it's a consensus, but my term is it's a majority rule. Um, I have some strong, I, th I think churches should appoint leaders. This is what happened in Corinthians and Thessalonians before elders. But here's just a, a quiet observation. There are two majority decisions in the Bible. One is... 10 out of the 12 said, we're like grasshoppers, we can't go in. The other majority decision is, oh, we can go ahead and sail, even though it's getting late in the year. And the bottom line is, both majority of the decisions ended up as a disaster. And sometimes what seems obvious to many may not be the best course of action. And when you look at Malta, and if you have your eye on, this is number four. And, and here's the contrast. And, and you think specifically of Ephesus and Corinth and Athens, uh, Malta, a speck in the Mediterranean, and unlike the mighty cities, here's this tiny place. It's about 18 miles long, eight miles wide, 58 miles south of Sicily, 180 miles north and east of the African coast, and you see descriptions about uh, the Roman occupation and especially during uh, the Punic Wars that were fought with uh, Carthage in North Africa. But I thought this was very interesting. Malta was named by the Phoenicians, and Melita meant a place of refuge. And this was the original naming of the island that was preserved. And you stop and think, kind of both physically and emotionally, at this stage of Paul's life, uh, it's a place of refuge for him. Remember Luke said earlier, we'd given up all hope of being saved, and Paul stood up and says, don't be afraid, uh, we're all going to be saved, I'm going to stand before Caesar. 
And I'll leave you to look at these, but there are eight times that either God, Christ, or an angel uh, spoke to Paul in his ministry. And we'll touch on this again next week, but look at these quickly. Damascus Road, Acts 16, Macedonian call, come help us. Acts 18 in Corinth, be strong, don't be afraid, speak the word. Uh, he's going to be sent from Jerusalem for his safety in Acts 22. Uh, Acts 23, again, you will preach in Rome, take courage. Uh, God promised them safety while they're being tossed at sea in Acts 27. And then 2 Corinthians 12, whether I was in the body or out of the body, I don't know, but there was a man who was caught up into paradise and uttered things, saw things that he cannot utter. So another vision that Paul has. And then in 2 Timothy 4, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me. So here's our closing thoughts. Dr. Luke gives us a vivid account of the shipwreck and the snake attached itself to his hand and he wanted Theophilus to appreciate Paul was not only heavenly directed but he was also a heaven protected man because he's the apostle to the Gentiles and he will take the gospel to the center of the Roman Empire to Rome and then as we'll see next week did he finally get to Spain? That had been his uh, goal for a long time. And when you notice, what did God, uh, Christ tell the apostles in Acts 1 and 8? We're going to start with Jerusalem, Judea and Samaria, uttermost parts of the earth. And Paul, in his own way, continues to carry that out. So here's our closing thought. Paul would never anticipate it spending a winter uh, refreshed by the hospitality shown to the victims of the shipwreck. And like I said, 2 Corinthians eleven twenty five. I think this is the fourth shipwreck that he's been involved in. God gave him a chance to, and I, this is my expression, catch his breath and rest before the challenge of his defense and his preaching the gospel in Rome. And this is my expression, especially to my kids. I've told them, we oftentimes learn more about God through the rear view mirror than we do the windshield. And there's times in all of our lives that we'll look and hear something that either I wanted to do and it didn't happen or something I wasn't expected to do and that came out. And looking back, a lot of times we can see uh, the work of God in our lives in ways that we could never plan or anticipate. God cares for us in these ways. And remember when Paul stood up and the ships bend like this cork on the ocean for three weeks, he still has this unshakable faith in God, and he says, he is the God to whom I belong and to whom I worship. And I think what a fitting way for us to close because we too belong to a God, and that's the expression, this is whom I belong and this is whom I worship, and by the grace of God, uh, we're able to participate in that today. God bless.